We've got a big injury update. Well, we see Miguel Vargas again this year and a third baseman the Dodgers could trade for. That's coming up next on Dodgers Dugout. <laughs> What's going on, Dodgers Nation? Doug McCain here. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. If you haven't yet, for all latest Dodgers news and rumors all season long, be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. And if you really want to support the channel, you want to see us post even more Dodgers content, smash that like button. And as always, on with your takes down below in the comment section. Today's Dodgers Nation questions of the day. A couple of questions here. One, what do you want to see them do at second base with Miguel Vargas being optioned? What is your reaction to the Dodgers sending Miguel Vargas to down to the minors and then three what are your thoughts on the Dodgers pursuing a trade for Nationals third baseman Jamer Candelario let me know down below and for all latest Dodgers news head over to DodgersNation.com so we have to start with the Dodgers biggest roster news and that is that LA has optioned second baseman Miguel Vargas to the minors so it did feel like this was coming it did feel like the writing was on the wall especially on Friday after Dave Roberts told reporters after he was asked about the slumping Vargas in the pond possibility of sending him down he told reporters I think everything should be on the table he would go on to say there's a piece of winning here and there's also a piece of putting his mind where it needs to be because clearly right now he's pressing he's never struggled like this there comes a point where we've got to run out our best options to win a baseball game so that tells you right there that one they feel like he's lost his confidence and two he's not helping this team he's hurting this team at the plate and there's no question you know I bring my facts to the fight and the numbers tell you that he's been one of the worst rookies in the league. Rookies with a minimum of 300 plate appearances, his 195 batting average, that ranks last. His 85 weighted runs created plus, that's third to the bottom. So 15% below league average. That's not terrible. That's where Gavin Lux's numbers were after his first full season. And you saw the leap he took that second year after that first full season. And if you look at that 0.1 F4, that ranks last. And just some of the other numbers, I mean, he's hitting 79 with a 390 95 OPS since June 9th. His weight runs created plus is 14th since June 9th. So he's struggling across the board. He hasn't been able to find it. He just really is not the guy that we saw last season. You look at the hard contact numbers. They're just not there. Last year, he did look great when he was given his opportunity, but still the contact numbers were there. Unfortunately, he's just not finding many barrels. The confidence definitely looks like it is lost right now. If you look at his average exit velocity in the 13th percentile, Max exit velocity in the 46th percentile, hard hit percentage in the 12th percentile, expected batting average in the 6th percentile. The really, only thing he really does at an above average to elite level is chase rate in the 89th percentile, walk rate in the 87th percentile, above average with the whiff percentage, K percentage, and sprint speed. But all in all, defensively, you're seeing three outs above average with a low arm strength. So he definitely was not helping this team. And I spoke to scouts, I spoke to hitting gurus, and they tell me that when they see Miguel Vargas that he's more of a horizontal bat whereas guys like JD Martinez they're vertical bats horizontal bat guys you have to keep your hands inside the ball to cover east west better vertical bats you have to keep their hands above the ball and cover north south better Vargas is going around the ball so he needs to be a little more inside the ball go east west like we've seen him do throughout his career because the hit tool is there the flashes have been there seven home runs had a four hit game with three doubles he's just been in consistent and look the production just hasn't been there at the end of the day the bottom line is you can't justify him as an everyday second baseman now what should the Dodgers do well another thing this signals to me is that they want to win now and you might want to have a veteran in that second base spot yes the youth movement that was definitely a concept an idea yes you've given guys opportunities like James Altman a lot of the pitchers but look let's be honest here none of the Dodgers top seven prospects have established themselves as legit everyday big leaguers. Yes, Bobby Miller has flashed. I think he has the potential to be a frontline guy. Yes, what we've seen from Emmett Sheehan has been impressive. Yes, Michael Bush, he had the game-winning hit against the Padres, and he's shown some flashes, but we haven't seen any of these guys take the bull by the horns and just run with it to the point where you say, hey, this is his spot. He's going to be the solution long-term. And look, a lot of that is just the nature of being a rookie in Major League Baseball. Look, this is one of, if not the hardest sport in the world, especially as a rookie. Look, success is 
is not always linear for big league rookies. It's a very challenging game. So you're not going to just have these guys come up and just come out and shove every start or hit 300 to have success early on. But that is a part of the process. And you have to let these guys struggle so they can be contributors later down the line. It's a part of the process. That's why experience is the best currency for young players. Now, the next big question is, what are the options for the Dodgers at second base? Who takes over at the keystone position? Well, first, let's talk about Michael Bush. Michael Bush, it's a very complicated conversation, in my opinion, because if you look at the Dodgers, best lineup right now against right-handed pitching, it involves Mookie Betts playing in the infield, playing either shortstop or second base, and in the outfield, looks like David Peralta, who's been one of the best hitters in the game since the beginning of June, James Altman in center, and then Jason Hayward in right field. So that is the lineup in the outfield and the infield. You got Rojas and you got Mookie Betts. And then also, too, you got those questions about Michael Bush at second base as well. Some of the defensive shortcomings that we saw with Miguel Vargas early on, that could be the same with Michael Bush. So it's not as easy as saying, okay, now let's get Michael Bush's opportunity, even though he has raked at the AAA level with an OPS over 1,000. You have to look at the Dodgers' best lineup, and does that include him in there? Well, hey, that really all depends, right? So Bush, I love him as a player. It just does feel like he doesn't have the greatest spot for this team. Now, another thing you could do is one thing I've advocated for. You heard me talk about this guy a few weeks ago on Blue Heaven was how about you add a veteran infielder? And you can do that in a couple of different ways. Jamir Candelario of the Washington Nationals is a name that intrigues me. Now, Candelario, this is a guy that defensively, a massive upgrade over Max Muncy at third base. And you could take Max Muncy, who has been one of the worst defensive third baseman's in the sport and move him back to second base. Now, he's not going to be a gold glove caliber second baseman or anything like that, but that is something you could consider and you sure up that third base spot. If you look at Candelario's numbers, a 118 weighted runs created plus, that's actually tied with Max Muncy. That's 10th in Major League Baseball, but a 4.5 defensive F war compared to Muncy's negative 2.6 defensive F4. Hey, we saw last year in the NLDS against the Padres. That double down the line, Hassan Kim. We saw Max Muncy struggle with backhands down the line. So to have a better defender at third base, that could definitely pay dividends in the postseason. Now you look at his numbers versus lefties, a 755 career OPS. This year, that number is down to 689. An 871 OPS though versus righties. He's been raking against righties. Also 13 home runs and a 2.8 B war. Now that's a guy that can absolutely contribute. Now he's also a switch hitter, has some versatility. And most importantly, if you're Andrew Friedman in the Dodgers, He's not under team control after this season. He will be a free agent after this year. So this is a rental. This is an expiring contract. And it really gives you a veteran that you can trust defensively, a contributor offensively, and allows you to move Max Muncy around. But don't forget that name, Jamie Candelario. I think that's a name that you're going to start to see surfing quite a bit after the All-Star break. And also don't forget who told you about the Dodgers possibly trading for him first. If that happens, I won't take a big victory lap, but I definitely think this is a guy that can help this team, a guy I'm definitely in favor of the Dodgers going after. Now, the other thing, too, is you're not going to have to give too much prospect capital. I mean, he's a really, really nice player, but he's not going to require your top five prospects or anyone like that. We're talking about a rental, so that's something that this organization likes. They don't like to pay top dollar. What I always say, they don't like to buy the Halloween candy on Halloween, right? They like to buy it the day after when you can get some value and get a little bit of a discount. Now, you're not going to get a big discount, but still, I think you could get him without having to part ways with your top guys. We know that the Dodgers, they only want to do that if they're getting a player that is a massive impact player that's under team control for multiple seasons. So I think Candelario makes a lot of sense for a lot of different reasons. Now, another option, of course, Chris Taylor, he is going to be returning. CT3, a little update on Chris Taylor. He will be activated off the IL. Most likely, he'll take Vargas' spot on the roster and he should be back on Friday for the Mets series, and he's played very well. Of course, Rancho Cucamonga hit the home run the other day. So Chris Taylor, though, look, I mean, what you get from Chris Taylor, 
This is pretty much CT3 in a nutshell. This is a below average bat, slightly below average. So far this year, a 94 weighted runs created plus. So offensively, he's 6% below league average. Last year, he was a 93 weighted runs created plus. So 7% below league average. Look, at some point in your career, you kind of just are what you are. And right now, that's really what he is. A slightly below average hitter, a 206 batting average. But the positive sign for CT3 this year is the power numbers. Are up. His slugging has gone from 373 last year to 455 this year. Already has 11 home runs, has one more than he had all of last year. So that definitely is a step in the right direction. And he's a guy that, look, sometimes he just catches fire. Sometimes he looks like the best hitter in the game for a two or three week stretch. You just hope that that's in the postseason. You saw what he did in 2021, the Oc Taylor walk off shot in the wild card game against the Cardinals. You saw him hit a three home runs in a game against the Braves in the NLCS. So he's a guy that definitely is a gamer defensively with the catches he made against the Brewers. So he's been on the I.O. with right knee soreness, has the bone bruise. So he is going to be back, and that definitely is at the very least going to help this versatility for this Dodgers defense. Of course, he's been playing mainly outfield this year, but he played shortstop for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. He hit a bomb. Boom! 454 feet, also had a walk. So he looks like he's ready to go. And yeah, I think you can expect him to be back in the Dodgers opener against the Mets after the All-Star break. So look for CT3 to be activated on Friday. So that's definitely some good news. Now, another option, a lot of you have been asking me about Joni Hernandez. That's how you say it, Joni Hernandez. He's been impressive, especially on the mound, especially as a defender. And yes, he is a viable option defensively at second base. And there is a possibility, yeah, you see him in there against lefties and you see Mookie in there against righties and you kind of switch it up and mix it up that way but that's not a big picture move you're not going to see him getting significant reps at second base down the stretch and into the postseason that's just not who he is that's not who this organization bills him to be yeah prove me wrong if you can go out there and rake and also defensively be a plus defender for an extended period of time at the big league level when we haven't seen that throughout your short career then yeah I'd be happy to be wrong on that but I can tell you that that definitely is not the plan but it's definitely nice to see him having some success so yeah I mean they definitely have options you definitely have guys you can turn to but really the Miguel Vargas situation I think the next big question becomes do you see him again this season does he return and get another opportunity for the Dodgers well I think it's going to depend on a lot of factors and one how well he hits down at the AAA level if he goes down there with a vengeance and you just can't keep him off the field and he's tearing the cover off the ball maybe there's a possibility he returns and also too with this team I think we know at this point you can never rule out injuries you just never know what's going to happen one game to the next and just like that Miguel Vargas could be back up starting at second base but yeah it's going to be very interesting because moving forward you really don't have that clear defined spot for him that he excels at I mean really he's a below average defender across the diamond what I've heard from people because a lot of people will say hey why don't you just move him to third base and play him at third base see how he fares there well look he does not like playing the hot corn that's but what I've been told when it comes to Miguel Vargas and really that's why he's been given this runway at second base so yeah really it's all about his offense offense is what's going to keep him at the big league level the offense is going to be his calling card in the show and as long as he produces at the plate you can justify him defensively and throw him at second base and he has improved give him credit the range has been better the instincts have been better there have been some rough patches at times but but that really was to be expected when you consider the fact that he had never played that position at the big league level and really hadn't played it at the minor league level for any stretches as well. So if I'm your stockbroker, I'm going to advise you not to sell all your Miguel Vargas stocks. One, he's still incredibly young, just 23 years old. Two, he still had less than 400 plate appearances at the big league level. Now, could he be a guy that doesn't work out, that doesn't become a star or an everyday big leaguer? Yes, that's possible. You know why? Because 70% of prospects don't work out so yes that is possible let's not be ridiculous here okay no one knows tomorrow's lottery numbers but still I think the hit tool the flashes that he's had some of the positive moments there is a reason to say hey I was still 
want to be in the Miguel Vargas business, and it might not be this year, but he's a guy you definitely keep in your organization to see if you can optimize him and see if you can realize that potential and a guy that really was your top hitting prospect. Now, could the Dodgers trade Miguel Vargas right now, include him in a package? Yeah, they absolutely could. There could be teams out there that covet him and say, hey, we've identified that, hey, we can maximize him. We see that potential, but most likely the value that he has right now is at a point where you don't want to sell him when the value is low. You don't want to do that. You want to cash in on your prospects while their value is higher. So I don't anticipate them trading him at the deadline or anything like that. I think they're going to work on him down at the AAA level, see if they can get him back to where he needs to be, and maybe he gets another opportunity this season. And if not, maybe we could see it next year, sort of like we saw with Gavin Lux, where he really takes a big step forward. But as the president of the Miguel Vargas fan club, I'd be lying to you if I said this didn't hurt a little bit, but you guys know what I say. Don't fall in love with players, fall in like with players, okay? You don't want to go head over heels for a player. For me, it's all about winning. Don't blind yourself with your favorite players. I'm looking about how do we win ball games, and right now, Miguel Vargas at second base was not giving the Dodgers the best chance to do that, especially when they have some better options internally and some they can explore externally. But let me know down below in the comment section, what is your reaction to the Dodgers moving down Miguel Vargas, and who do you want to see at second base, internally and externally? Who do you think gives the Dodgers the best chance to win? What are your thoughts long-term? Let me know down below. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. For all things Dodger baseball all season long, be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and if you want to see us post even more Dodgers content, smash that like button. And until next time, think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out.